He waded through the crush of vehicles, reaching the sidewalk as the light changed and the traffic blasted off behind him. This sidewalk was on his regular daily route. Just ahead of him, one minute away by foot, was the Salk, the intersection before the Masjid and Sambhaji Bridge. He crossed the two lanes, stood with the little crowd of pedestrians waiting for the gap, crossed again, suddenly remembering as he stepped up onto the sidewalk outside the mosque, the momentary life and death drama witnessed by no one but the gods that had taken place at this spot less than 24 hours before. Baba, he heard a man's voice say behind him, Sir. He turned and found himself face to face with the traffic cop, who had, after all, been one human witness to yesterday's act. Baba, yesterday, here, said the cop with difficulty. Yes, I remember, replied Ben in Marathi. This corner is very dangerous for children, isn't it? They should put up a barrier here. Was that his sister who came running up to him? Did she take him home? Betraying mild surprise at Ben's fluent Marathi, the cop replied after a pause, that was his sister, yes. She had been chasing him. I scolded her for that. But the two of them were with another relative, a woman. Did you see her? She was standing right here, near the wall. I think I may remember, said Ben. And he was, in fact, only now remembering the young woman standing in the rippling shade of this tree, who had stared at him as he continued on his way. It had been like a vision a still luminous, dantesque vision, returning from a deep past, too joyful and painful to remember, so much so that even the vision had been forgotten in the last twenty-four hours. She talked with me afterwards, said the cop. She said she was the boy and girl's aunt. She wanted to know if I had ever seen you before, and I told her that I see you here every day, precisely at 6.25, a little later than now, you're early today. She said she would come and look for you today, and she gave me this to give you. He took a folded paper out of his shirt pocket and handed it to him. He opened it, a blue-lined page, torn from a spiral notebook, and read the English written thereon. The boy you saved is my nephew. Could I please talk with you? I'll come back here tomorrow to look for you, and in case I don't find you, here are my phone number and email address. He looked up at the cop, who was staring at him expectantly. Thank you, he said, uncertainly, and glanced towards the shade and beyond, up the sidewalk, in the direction from which the children had come. Excitement stirred in his gut, an excitement with a strong aspect of dread. He did not need a beautiful young woman in his life who looked like who she did and who looked at him like that, and who owed him, as she probably thought, an unrepayable debt. But what would be the loss? It was too late anyway. He brought his gaze back to his interlocutor's face and said, Would you please tell her that I will treasure for life the memory of how I was able to help her nephew and her? He paused, suddenly conscious of the absurdly literary complexity of the Marathi he had just uttered and that I was not able to wait for her today, because for a certain reason my wife is urgently expecting me at home. But I have her phone number and email address. He raised the note held between twinned index and middle fingers. Please convey my hope for her, their future happiness, and for our future meeting, he added, moved by an unexpected impulse. He slipped the note into his shirt pocket smiled with genuine warmth at the rather baffled-looking cop, turned and continued on his way, rounding the wall of the masjid onto the bridge. Halfway across, he leaned on his forearms on the barrier and looked down at the mutah's stinking brown rivulet of sewage. She would almost certainly be there by now, talking with the cop. She might well follow his path, find him here, he felt a sudden surge of anguish. Why shouldn't he have waited? 
Why shouldn't he go back now? Only to see, only to enjoy the fate-sent illusion of her return. He glanced to his right, towards where the sidewalk disappeared round the mosque's wall, then looked down again at the river, neither deep nor distant nor toxic enough that he could fantasize about slipping over the bar and finding moksha, release, in this karmically appropriate way, drowning in Indian shit. Better to turn his mind instead to the hope for release that had suddenly presented itself in a different quarter. As he gazed up the river towards other bridges that he had regularly crossed during previous periods of his long exile in this city, the beginning of a new shloka came to him, and at the same time, unusually, the beginning of its melody. Nashid viwaswatas tejah, samudure imawana patet, na tuavon na bawishawa, kamayanta, yugi, yugi. The sun's light might die, the snowy mountain might fall into the sea, but we shall never cease to be loving each other age after age.